What's up guys, we're back with another day of MLB action here on Thursday, April 25th. Things looked pretty good for us there on Wednesday, guys. We went 4-1 and one overall. We cashed our biggest bet of the day, which was the Yankees, minus 1.5. That was a very, very solid one. We also saw the New York Mets get the win. We had them at plus 115, so when you're getting those kind of odds, feels pretty good to win those ones. We also had the Cubs minus 110 and the under 9 in the Toronto-Kansas City game. So just in general, a very, very solid day from us. Looking forward to keeping that rolling here in this one. We've got another great... MLB slate to break down, so let's go ahead and jump right in. First, let's take a second and hit that like button to show some support to the channel and all the work we're putting in here every single day. If you're new, go ahead and subscribe. It's 100% free and can keep you from missing out on these picks. Our videos are sponsored by StumpTheSpread.com. Click the link in the description and go over there and join our free email list and check out our top confidence plays on all the major sports. Comment below with all the bets you're looking at today and we will give you our best advice on all of them. We respond to absolutely every single comment, so let us know anything you want to say about my picks. These videos or anything you see here. As always, our final picks will be in the pinned comment down below. Now let's get into our first game of the day. We've got the Milwaukee Brewers taking on the Pittsburgh Pirates. Milwaukee comes into this game fresh off of a win there in game three, so they've still got a chance to split this four-game series. They won game three, three to two, so not exactly an offensive uh, explosion here from the Brewers, but they took it down. They got the win. We saw three hits from Contreras. He's been by far their hottest hitter to start the season. They're handing the ball in this one to Freddie Peralta, who's been off to a very good start of his own. He's 2-0 and with a 1.90 ERA. He's coming into this game fresh off of a shutout performance against the St. Louis Cardinals where he gave up only four hits over six innings of work, seven strikeouts, and two walks. So has to feel pretty good about that. He hasn't given up more than a single run in his last two starts. He did get touched up by the Seattle Mariners back on the fifth, but just in general, he's gotten off to a fantastic start to the season and has to feel pretty decent about this matchup. The Pirates come into this game. They've uh, they've hit something of a speed bump here. I mean, they did get two wins in the first two games of the series. They were very, very badly needed, though, because they were on a six-game losing streak coming into this series, so they definitely needed to find a way here. It sucks for them to lose that game 3-2, too, but when you're not scoring any runs, you can't really be expecting to win this games. This offense was off to a very, very good start, but they've certainly cooled off here later in the season. I mean, later in the season, we're only 25 games in, so not that much later. We saw the offense look good in the beginning, not so good later on. The Pirates are going to be hitting the ball in this one to Mitch Keller. He's 2-2 two two on the season with a 4.80 ERA, so not terrible, but he is coming off of a kind of mediocre start against the Red Sox where he gave up four earned runs in six innings, gave up five hits. He had four walks in that game, which is a pretty big concern. If you're going to walk that many batters, you're going to end up giving up some runs. The start before that, he went deep into the game, seven innings against the Phillies, but got touched up for a Eight hits, two earned runs in that one. He gave up a home run. He's given up a home run in three out of his five starts this season. So I don't know, guys. He's had a pretty good season kind of in general, I would say. But he's definitely pitched around some uh, tough spots. He's given up at least five hits in every game this season. He's given up eight hits two different times. So the guy is definitely getting dinged up a little bit. And that's kind of a tough look for the Pirates in general who aren't hitting the ball that great right now. We see Connor Joe leading the way for them. But just in general this season, they're 17th in the majors in terms of runs scored. They're 23rd in the majors in terms of slugging percentage. Like, those are not exactly elite kind of numbers. I mean, how many runs can we really expect from this team right now? They are 11th in the majors in terms of on-base percentage, but that number is certainly falling. They only scored two runs in their last game. They've only scored a grand total of two, three, four, five, five runs in three games in the series. So we can't exactly feel good about how they're looking at the plate. Looking at the numbers for this game, we see the Brewers. They're a slight favorite. They're minus 120 in this one. You can get the Pirates at plus 105. Looking at the over-under in this game, the odds make are not expecting a ton of offense here. You can find some seven and a halfs out there, but it looks like this is definitely going to be a seven or seven and a half over under game. Pretty tough spot if you ask me. There aren't a ton of trends here for us to lean on. We do see Pittsburgh is definitely trending towards being an under team here lately, and we haven't exactly been seeing the Brewers hit the cover off the ball. They haven't scored more than four runs in any game. They actually haven't scored more than three runs in any game since their last game against the St. Louis Cardinals, so that's a four game stretch here where they have not been hitting the ball very well. We definitely feel pretty good about Freddie Peralta out there on the mound. I mean, the guy has been absolutely dealing this season, so I think we're going to lean towards the Milwaukee Brewers minus 120 in this one. Neither one of those over-under numbers are very appealing to me. 
Next up, guys, we're the Boston Red Sox going on the road to take on the Cleveland Guardians. We saw the Red Sox get a much-needed win there in Game 2 of this series. They won 8 nothing, looking absolutely dominant in that one. They've actually won 4 out of the last 5 games overall. They're 1-1 one one in this series so far. They lost Game 1 4-1, to one, so just in general, they have to feel a little bit better about the direction things are going. They're now 14-11 and 11 this season overall. The question for them in this game is what are they going to do for starting pitching? Right now, it's currently undecided who they're going to put out there on the mound. We just saw them send Bell to the IL like this team has had a myriad of pitching injuries this season so far so it looks like this is basically just going to be a bullpen game where it's mix and match we're going to see a lot of different arms out there for them and we'll just see what they can actually do in this game but just in general the Red Sox probably feel pretty good about how the offense has looked lately they've really come alive here obviously they didn't look great in game one of the series but overall things are definitely pointed up for this squad they scored eight four and six runs in their series against the Pirates and this one they scored one but then they had an eight run outburst in game two to win eight to nothing so definitely have to feel pretty positive about how the offense has looked. It's going to need to keep looking good, though, going up against the Cleveland Guardians, who are 17-7 and seven on the season so far. They're off to a very good start. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Tristan McKenzie, who's been a little bit of a mixed bag here, but he's coming off of a very solid start against the Oakland A's, where he gave up only a single earned run on three hits over five innings of work. He had six strikeouts in that game, but he also had three walks, so it wasn't exactly a lights-out outing, but the guy's 2-2 two and two on the season. An ERA of five isn't fantastic, but he's had two very good starts and two kind of middle of the road starts. The question is, what kind of starts are you going to have in this one? The Guardians in general have been putting up plenty of offense this season. They're top five or top ten in pretty much every major hitting category. We've seen Stephen Kwan get off to a good start. Josh Naylor's off to a very good start. And just in general, this team, they're fourth in the majors and run scored, seventh in team batting average, sixth in team slugging percentage. So they are a squad that's very, very likely to put up some runs. Looking at the numbers for this game, it's a little bit weird. We see the over-under is currently at seven, so we might want to be looking at the over in this game. I mean, obviously, we just saw the uh, Guardians get kind of shut down offensively, so we would think they're going to have a bounce-back game in this one, but I think what we're going to be more focused on is the Cleveland Guardians minus 115. That seems like a very reasonable number. I don't have a ton of faith here in Tristan McKenzie, but I do have more faith in him than I have in just the entire Red Sox uh, pitching staff trying to cobble together a start here. So definitely give me the Cleveland Guardians minus 115 that seems like a very cheap price on what is by far the better team. Moving right along, guys, we got the Chicago White Sox going on the road to take on the Minnesota Twins. We just saw the White Sox take another loss. They've now lost six in a row. They lost six to three in that game. So we saw the over hit in a game where the odds makers were expecting very, very little offense. The White Sox are going to be hitting the ball in this one to Michael Soraka. He's off to a pretty rocky start, guys. He's 0-3 with a 7.50 ERA. He hasn't given up less than four earned runs in any of his last three starts. His last time out against the Guardians, he only lasted three and two-thirds innings, gave up four earned runs in that span, three walks, four strikeouts, not exactly a fantastic start. His last time out against the Phillies, he went four and two-thirds innings, gave up five earned runs on six hits. He had three walks and only two strikeouts in that one. This big right-hander just not really having a very good time. There's no way around it. Not off to a very good start. Not nearly as bad of a start, though, as the Chicago White Sox offense, which is the by far worst offensive unit in the game. Nobody's off to a good start. They scored only 50 runs through, let's see what it is, 24 games this season. This is a nightmare, guys. Their team batting average is under 200. Last in the majors in slugging percentage. Last in the majors in on-base percentage. This team just does not hit the ball. The Twins come into this game. They've now won three in a row. They're looking to finish off this series with a 4-0 to zero sweep. That's usually a pretty tough thing to do, but the odds makers don't seem to think so in this one. They're handing this, the ball to Bailey Ober. He comes into this game 1-1 one one with a 4.91 ERA, but he's looked absolutely lights out in his last three starts. His first start of the season, he got obliterated by the Kansas City Royals, and ever since then, the guy has just been dealing. He's, he gave up one run. One, there was an earned run on two hits over six innings of work against the Tigers, and he struck struck out six, and that was the second time he had faced the Tigers, and he pretty much dominated them both times. He also had a fantastic five-inning start against the Dodgers, where he gave up only a single run on three hits. He had seven strikeouts in that outing. He has just been absolutely dealing in this one, and that's why we see this big number for the Twins, who are sitting at minus 240. Minnesota, in general, hasn't been hitting the ball great, but they've been hitting the ball a little bit better here lately. It probably helps a bit to be going against the Chicago White Sox, so 
I don't know guys, it seems like a very exorbitant price to take the Twins minus 240. If we look at the run line in this one, if you take the Twins minus one and a half, you can get them at minus 115 or minus 110, something like that. So that seems much more reasonable. I think we're gonna be on the Twins minus 110 in this one, despite the fact they're not a very good team against the run line. Will this make it into our pinned comment picks? I tend to slightly doubt it, but we'll have to see. There's a shot they could be in there. So we'll be taking a look here at the Twins minus one and a half. Next up, guys, we're going to be looking at the Philadelphia Phillies going on the road to take on the Cincinnati Reds. We've seen the Phillies lose two out of three here to start this series. They lost eight to one in game two. They lost seven to four in game three. They did get a seven to nothing win in game one, so we'll take that for sure. But at 15 and 10 on the season, I don't think it's really time to press the panic button or anything like that. They've just been having a bit of a hard uh, time pitching here. They haven't gotten great outings from their starters. They're handing the ball in this one to Zach Wheeler, hoping he can continue to look very, very good and that they can maybe give the poor guy some run support. Over five starts this season, he's only one and three, but his ERA is 2.30. His last time out, he looked fantastic against the White Sox, seven and thirds innings, eight strikeouts, only a single hit over that span. The start before that, he did get touched up by the Pirates, so maybe the onus isn't really on his offense in this game, but in this one, we definitely feel pretty good about having him out there on the mound. In his start earlier this season against the Reds, he did give up a single earned run, but he had 10 strikeouts, so he was absolutely dealing out there, so we can feel pretty good about that, and they have to feel a little bit sketchy about this game being at the Great American Ballpark. The Phillies' offense, though, you would think they'd be able to put up some runs, but we haven't seen a ton of that here in the series. I mean, I guess they scored four runs in their last outing, but that was just not enough to get the job done. We don't necessarily think we're going to see Bryce Harper back for this game, so that leaves a little bit of a hole in the Phillies offense, but not a huge insurmountable problem. We see the Cincinnati Reds come into this game. They've won two in a row now and five of their last six overall. They're 14 and 10 on the season. So that feel pretty good about how things are going here in the early part of the season. We've seen Ellie De La Cruz get off to a fantastic start and the Reds are handing the ball in this one to Nick Martinez. He comes into this game. He's going to be making his third start of the season. After his first two outings as a starter, they decided to send him to the bullpen for a little bit. He's looked slightly better out of the pen, but guys, just in general, things have not looked great for him here in the early goings. He's gotten touched up by the Washington Nationals, touched up by the Mets. He also gave up some hits and uh, earned run to the Mariners. So his last time out, he did go three innings, only gave up two hits and zero runs against the Angels. So I guess they saw what they needed to see to decide to put him back there out on the mound. But just in general, guys, I'm not feeling fantastic about Nick Martinez out there on the mound. The Reds' offense has looked very good with 15 combined runs over their last two games. Like we said, Ellie De La Cruz is off to a fantastic start, and this offense, just in general, is looking very, very good. Their team batting average is a bit suspect. That uh, makes me a little bit concerned, but they're finding a way to get runs across the plate, guys. They're 8th in the majors in runs scored. They're 12th in the majors in team slugging percentage, which playing at the Great American Ballpark, that doesn't hurt that very much at all, but in this game in general, I think we're going to shade towards the Phillies. I think we'll see a great Great start here from Zach Wheeler. I don't really think the over-under being at 8.5 has a lot of value, so we're going to stick with the Phillies, minus 150. It's a bit of a steep price, but I don't really like the front line numbers here, so go ahead and give me the Phillies just to go ahead and win this game straight up. Next up, guys, we got the Toronto Blue Jays going on the road to take on the Kansas City Royals. We saw the under come through for us in that one, so that felt pretty good. We also saw the Blue Jays take the 3-2 loss. Both get the last two games in this series have been 3-2 losses. The Blue Jays are now needing a win here in game number four just to split the series, but looking at Jose Barrios. He's getting the ball in this game and he has been absolutely lights out this season. The guy has looked borderline unhittable. I guess he did give up five hits against the Padres his last time up, but he had six strikeouts, gave up zero runs over six innings. The start before that, he dominated the Colorado Rockies. The start before that, he dominated the Seattle Mariners, and you guys can kind of just see how things have gone for him this season. I mean, the guy's ERA barely exists. He's 4-0. and He's got 27 strikeouts this year. This uh, short right-hander, just looking like a monster right now. The Toronto Blue Jays offense, on the other hand, not really looking so hot right now. They've only scored four runs over their last two games combined, and their win in game one of this series. They only won five to three, so not exactly a huge offensive outburst. We've seen Justin Turner get off to a good start, but other than that, not a lot of positives to point to for this offense. They're in the bottom third of the majors in basically every major statistical category, so I don't think a team that scored only 93 runs and is 22nd in the majors in offense, not going to get me going too much. They're going to need to find a way to score some runs here against the Royals, who are 2-0 in their last two games. They're up 2-1 to one in this series, so had to feel pretty good about that, but unfortunately they did just have to uh, blow through a lot of guys in the bullpen. We saw Alec Marsh pitch and then four relievers. They combined for a six hitter to win that game three to two. So they probably feel pretty good about that, but they're going to be handing the ball in this game to Cole Rangans, hoping that he can go very deep into the game.
game and take some pressure off of that bullpen. It's kind of a big ask, though, guys. His last time out, he got absolutely obliterated. He only went one and two-thirds innings against the Baltimore Orioles, gave up seven earned runs on nine hits. Yeah, that's a pretty scary outing, and you can't get out of the second inning. That is pretty much nightmare material. His outing before that, though, he looked very good against the New York Mets, but in general this season, he hasn't had a very good time. We've seen the Royals go only one and four in games that he has started, so not exactly the best look. I mean, you could guess that maybe he'll have a bounce back here, but I don't know, guys. It seems like a big ass for me, and also a big ass from the Kansas City Royals has been scoring runs. Their offense not looking so hot right now. We do see Salvador Perez still hitting the ball very well, but team batting average is pretty low. Their team slugging percentage is good. It's in the top 10 in the majors, so that's pretty shocking. They're managing to score runs somehow, I guess, but this just isn't an offensive team that gets me super excited. 114 runs gets them tied for 10th in the majors, so it's not terrible, but we've seen the under be pretty good in this series in general. Looking at the numbers for this game, guys, we've got an over-under of 8. We see the Royals are small favorites at minus 112. We see the Toronto Blue Jays and their struggling offense are plus 102. Uh, guys, we're getting plus numbers with Jose Barrios out there on the mound, and the guy has been an absolute machine this season. We're not going to overthink this. We're going to take the guy who looks like the far better pitcher this season, and we're going to fade the guy coming off of an absolute horrendous start, and he's had a couple of really bad starts this season in general, so give me the Toronto Blue Jays plus 102 in this one, despite the fact they're playing on the road. You could take a look at the over-under in this game if you think that Rangans is going to have some sort of bounce back, but we're going to be on the Toronto Blue Jays plus 102. I think there's a very solid chance this ends up being one of our core plays for the night. Next up, guys, we're going to look at the Houston Astros going on the road to take on the Chicago Cubs. The Astros come into this game. They are now on a four-game losing streak. They've lost the first two games of the series, 7-2 to and 4-3, to so I guess at least that one was close, but man, that... Things cannot feel good for the Astros right now. They're seven and 18 on the season, but they probably feel pretty good here handing the ball to Justin Verlander. He got the win in his first start of the season. He didn't look exactly lights out against the Nationals in that one, but he looks pretty good. Six innings of work, only four hits, two earned runs. He did give up a home run and he only had four strikeouts, but he's probably still rounding into form a little bit here and he looked very, very good in that game. The problem for the Astros though has been their offense. Just in general, they're not quite finding a way to score runs. It's weird because the rest of their numbers look pretty respectable. They have Jose Altuve off to a very good start, but in this series, they've only scored three and two runs respectively. The game before that, their last game against the Nationals, they got shut out in that game. So I don't know why they can't find a way to like get some runs across the plate, but it is just not happening for them this season. Maybe this is a little bit karma for all of those years of the uh, trash cans going on, but I don't know, guys. It's just been wild. This team not scoring a lot of runs, and they're going to need to put something on the board here against the Chicago Cubs, who've now won three of their last four overall. That last one was definitely a very close game. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Javier Assad. He's been very good to start this season. He's 2-0 with a 2.11 ERA. He comes into this game fresh off of a short but effective outing against the Marlins. He only went four and two-thirds innings, but he only gave up a single run, and he did have three walks, so the guy has shown the ability to walk some batters. It's the second time this season he's had three walks, so maybe we could be a little bit worried about his control, and we're not exactly going to alert the press about a game where you did well against the Miami Marlins. Not exactly one of the elite teams out there in the majors, but in general, good numbers, a relatively good starter, Cubs are going to need to put up some more offense, although they've looked pretty good hitting the ball this season so far. They're sixth in the majors in terms of runs scored. They are 12th in the majors in terms of team batting average. Batting average, not their best stat, but other than that, their on-base percentage and slugging percentage, they're looking like top five teams in the majors to me, so I think we can safely expect the Cubs to score some runs here, but that could be a tall task going against Verlander, who I expect to only get stronger here as the season goes on, assuming that he can avoid injuries, so Looking at the numbers for this game, we see the Astros are 14, 8, and 2 to the under. We see Chicago is basically a 50-50 over-under team, but, I mean, are they going to score a ton of runs here against uh, somebody like Verlander? I don't really see that. Guys, unless you have some weird weather news with the wind, like, blowing out at Wrigley Field, I think we might take a taste of the under 8 in this one. I don't think we're going to find any 8.5s out there, so it'll be a straight-up under 8, but we haven't seen a ton of offense in this series in general, and I don't think we're going to see a ton in this game with two relatively solid pitchers out there. I mean, I don't super, super trust Assad, but I do think we see another good start from Verlander. And if you wanted to take the Astros minus 125 in this one, I wouldn't argue with you too much, but I don't know how much run support he's really going to get. 
Next up, we've got the Seattle Mariners going on the road to take on the Texas Rangers. The Mariners come into this game. They're currently down 5-1 to one in the bottom of the eighth, so things are not looking very good for them in game two of this season. However, they've gotten off to, I mean, they've been coming back alive. Well, they got off to a terrible start to the season. They've kind of clawed their way back. They're 12-11, and 11, looking like they're going to be 12-12 12 and 12 on the season. And with how things went in the early goings, I don't think they can be too upset about that. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Luis Castillo. He comes into this game. Uh, things have been a little bit rough for him this season overall, but his last start was by far his best. He went seven innings of two-hit ball against the Colorado Rockies. He had nine strikeouts and only a single walk in that outing. I mean, I get it, guys. It was against the Rockies, but this is his second good start in a row. He had a solid start. He only gave up two earned runs against the Chicago Cubs in six innings of work. He had nine strikeouts in that one, so we can count on him to pile up some strikeouts. Can we count on him to keep the other team from scoring a bunch of runs? I don't know, guys. That seems like kind of a different deal, and if you're allowing runs and you're pitching for the Seattle Mariners, that can be a pretty tough look because this offense is not great. They're in the bottom third of the majors in pretty much every major statistical category. We've seen Cal Raleigh get off to a good start to the season with six home runs and batting 271, but they're not a ton of super bright spots out there for the Mariners' offense, and they're going to need to put up some runs against the Texas Rangers, who come into this game. Looks like they're going to be fresh off a win. They're getting some good news from Scherzer. He stri struck out four in his first rehab start, so he's coming along. He's going to be back pretty soon. They haven't looked great recently. I mean, they're going to be two and five or two and three over the last five games. So not a fantastic uh, number right there. And they're 12 and 12 on the season overall. They're going to be hitting the ball in this one to Andrew Heaney. He comes into this game still looking for his first win of the year. He's 0-2 with a 6.35 ERA, so not exactly a starter we're in love with right now. The last time out against the Atlanta Braves, he gave up three earned runs, two home runs, and we also see that the Rangers are 0-4 in games that he's started, so not exactly the guy you're uh, super stoked to have out there on the mound. And the Rangers offense, while it has come alive a little bit for this one, has been trending slightly downward since getting off to a pretty hot start. I mean, they're 10th in the majors in terms of run scored, so like that's obviously not terrible. Team batting average still has them in the top 10. Their team on base percentage and slugging percentage, both of those numbers are falling a bit, so we can be a little bit concerned about where their offense is at. And just in general, we have to be very concerned about their starter in this game, so... I don't know, guys. This is kind of a tough spot. I think I'm going to lean slightly towards the Mariners in this game, but I don't know if this is one we're going to have a ton of action on. The over-under is currently at 9, and Seattle is one of the best teams in the majors to the under, and they're coming off a game where they're not going to really score any runs, it doesn't look like. The Rangers are a 50-50 over-under team, so if you wanted to take a look at that under, that would definitely make sense, some sense to me too, but how much faith do we really have here in Heaney? Like, what is he going to do? So, Maybe give me a little bit of the under or a little bit of the Mariners, but I'm not going to be on the Rangers in this one with Heaney out there on the mound. Next up, we're leading the Los Angeles Dodgers going on the road to take on the Washington Nationals. We saw the Dodgers get the win, a dominant 11-2 win there in Game 2 of this series. They're looking to uh, keep just keep things on rolling. The Dodgers are only 15-11 on the season, which might seem amazing, but for this loaded squad, I think they probably expected a little bit better of a start. They're going to be handing the ball in this one to Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I hope I pronounced that right. I think I did. He comes into this game. He's 1-1 one one in the season with a 4.50 ERA. He's fresh off of a, uh, we'll say, a decent but not great start against the Mets where he gave up three earned runs over six innings. He gave up seven hits, but he also had nine strikeouts in that outing, so not terrible. And he's had some very bright moments this season uh, dominating the Cubs and the Cardinals over the course of this year. But I don't know, guys. Last time out didn't exactly fill me with tons of optimism. The Mets aren't exactly a team that's hitting the ball super, super well here in the early goings. But... I mean, let's not freak out. I think there's a decent chance the guy could be in for a good season. Looking at the Dodgers offense, we see just amazing numbers. Otani is absolutely killing it right now. The team batting average, it's run scored. All those major hitting numbers are way, way up there towards the top of the majors, and they've just looked very, very good. Otani's batting 371 on the season right now. Mookie Betts has six home runs and is batting over 360. Guys, this team is absolutely just crushing, crushing rushing the ball right now. No negatives to report for them whatsoever. They're going to hope to keep doing that going up against Mackenzie Gore, who's starting here for the Washington Nationals. He's gotten off to a pretty good start uh, as opposed to what the Nationals have done with their 10-3 and record overall, but his last time out, he did have a little bit of a tough time against the Houston Astros. He only lasted four innings in that game, gave up seven hits, three earned runs, so not that great. He was coming off a very good 11 strikeout performance against the Oakland A's, so what is he going to do here against one of the best hitting teams in the major? 
majors. He hasn't exactly faced a ton of super tough offensive teams, although I guess he did get off to like starting his season against the Pirates back when they were hitting the cover off the ball. So maybe he gets a little bit of a pass in that one. But just in general, the problem for the Nationals has kind of been their offense. They're just not scoring runs right now. They're 27th in the majors and runs scored. Team batting average, team on base percentage, all those kind of numbers are kind of hovering around a league average. CJ Abrams is off to a good start. Luis Garcia is off to a good start. But other than that, there's not a ton of positives here to point at for the Nationals. They come into this game as pretty big underdogs, as one tends to expect when you're going up against the Dodgers. And I don't think we have a ton of faith here in Mackenzie Gore. We're going to be looking at that Dodgers run line number again in this one. I don't know if this makes it into our pinned comment play. I mean, if you take a minus one and a half, you can get him at minus 120. But I think that's definitely the bet we're looking the most likely to take in this game. I don't love that over under number as I don't have a ton of faith here in the Dodgers starter. But definitely give me the Dodgers minus one and a half in this one. I think they find a way to get the job done. Next up, guys, we're looking at the San Diego Padres going on the road to take on the Colorado Rockies. We see the Padres come into this game. They're currently in the bottom of the ninth right now. They're up 5-2, to two, so they're definitely expecting to take the win in this one to bounce back from losing game two of this series. The Padres are only 13-13, and 13, looking like they're probably going to be 14-13 and 13 on the season overall. Not really the start they were hoping to get off to. They're try trying, hoping they can keep pace here with the Dodgers there in the NL West, but that's going to be a very, very tough task. They're handing the ball in this one to Randy Vasquez. He comes into this game 0-1 on the season with a 1.80 ERA. It's only his second start of the year. He looked, um, we'll say slightly decent. He looked a little suspect, I'll say that, in his first start of the year. He gave up four runs on five hits in five innings pitch, but only one of those runs was earned. He did give up a home run, three strikeouts and one walk. I don't really know, guys. It's a little bit tough to tell from this very, very limited sample size what we're going to see from this guy over the course of this season. The Padres offense in general has gotten off to a very good start, though. They're seventh in the majors and run scored eighth in batting average. Fernando Tatis has already hit six home runs, is batting 270. We see Jackson Merrill off to a good start. This team in general is hitting the ball pretty well. They've hit the ball pretty good in their game they're currently playing. They've scored five runs. So they even scored four runs in their loss last night. So I think we can feel pretty decent about the Padres' ability to put up some runs. And they're going to need to score some runs here going up against the Rockies. Not that they've been the greatest offensive team ever, but when you're playing at Coors Field, you're going to need to get some runs across the plate. The Rockies are handing the ball in this one to Dakota Hudson, who's not off to the best start ever. He's 0-4 with a 5.06 ERA. He's coming off, I guess, a decent start for him. I don't know. That seems like a bit of a stretch, especially when you're getting knocked around by the Seattle Mariners. They lost that game 7-0. The Rockies are 0-4 in games that he has started this season. And against the Mariners, he gave up four earned runs and a home run. And he had five walks in that game. Like, things are just not working out for this guy. And things really aren't looking that hot for the Colorado Rockies offense. They've only scored 88 runs this season, 23rd in the majors. Team batting average is decent, but their team slugging percentage, despite playing in an extremely hitter-friendly park, pretty terrible. Team on-base percentage, also terrible. We've seen Brenton Doyle. He's hit the ball, I guess, okay. I mean, he's batting over 300, but when that's what you're looking at as your big positive for the season, you can tell your offense isn't in the best spot. Look at the numbers for this game. We see the Padres are significant favorites. They're minus 148 in this one. The Rockies are plus 136. We see crazy over-under numbers of 11 or 10 and a half. Not super interested in those. I mean, I think we do see a decent amount of offense, but that is an awful lot to ask for. Guys, we're going to be on the Padres in this one. I think we have some faith here in Vasquez, but I don't think we have enough for this to end up being one of our uh, pinned comment plays. So definitely take the Padres if you're super interested in this game, but I will not be on this one in a big way until I see some more out of Vasquez and know what to expect from him this season. In our last game of the night, guys, we're looking at the Oakland A's going on the road here to take on the New York Yankees in game four of their series. We did see the A's steal game one, two to nothing, but since then, things haven't looked great. They lost four to three in game two, and then seven to three, uh, as predicted by us, there in game three. The A's are going to be handing the ball in this one to Alex Wood. He's 0-2 with a 7.89 ERA, so not really the start he was hoping for to the season. He's given up four earned runs in each of his last two games. He's also given up a home run in each one of those games. They were... They're like, his last time out getting shelled by the Cleveland Guardians, that's not a terrible, uh, like, maybe not a super shocking look. Like, that's going to happen to a lot of guys this season. But getting shelled by the Washington Nationals, that has to feel pretty bad. Just in general this season, not having a good time out there, and neither are the A's. So I guess we can't be too shocked by that. Their offense is one of the worst in the majors just in general. We're not going to spend a ton of time looking at this, guys. They just cannot hit the ball. I mean, they're 
29th in the league in terms of runs scored, 29th in the league in terms of team batting average. That's really all you need to know. This team not pushing a lot of guys across the plate, and they're going to need to find a way to score some runs going up against the Yankees, who come into this game 17-8 and on the season, off to a very, very hot start. They're handing the ball on this one to Nestor Cortez. He's 1-1 one one with a 3.41 ERA, so he's off to a pretty good start. He shut out the Tampa Bay Rays his last time out, going seven innings of work, only six hits, nine strikeouts in that span, and no runs allowed. So has to feel pretty good about that. He did get knocked around by the Cleveland Guardians a little bit. That's going to happen to a lot of guys, like we were just saying. But just in general this season, he's looked pretty respectable. And he's going up against a team that he has to feel like he has a very good chance against. The Yankees, in general, they've now won three out of their last four. Their bats are seeming to come alive a little bit. I mean, not a massive outburst here. But they are definitely navigating their way into the top half of the majors. Their team on base percentage is very, very good. That's how they're scoring these runs. Team batting average still not looking so hot. We do see Juan Soto off to his very... Very, very hot start. Everybody knows about that, though, so we're not going to waste a ton of time there. The guy's absolutely killing it right now, but team slugging percentage also not looking that amazing, but we definitely expect the Yankees' bats to continue to improve here as the season goes on. Looking at the numbers for this game, we see the Yankees are massive favorites, minus 240 in this one. The over-under is at 8.5 or 8. You can find both numbers out there, and we do see the Yankees are huge under team this season. They're 15, 8, and 1 to the under, but I don't think we're too interested in the under in this one, guys. We're going to be more looking at the Yankees against the run line. If you take a minus 1.5, you can get them at minus 120. I think that has a very solid chance at ending up being one of our key plays for the day. The Yankees are just the far, far better team. I don't see any way they should be losing games or even playing close games against the A's, especially when they're putting out such a weak starter. That's the whole slate here in MLB today, guys. Hit that like button for good luck on all your bets and subscribe to the channel if you're new. Let me know in the comments any questions you have on today's slate. Thanks for watching. You can click the link in the description to check out StumpTheSpread.com and we'll see you tomorrow for more sports betting action.